So Seamus, I remember back in the day, you made some levels for the original Doom, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, m I made some that turned out to be quite popular in their day. So you're basically a developer in the Doom franchise. What do you think of the new Doom game? I'm assuming you played it. That, that's right. I'm basically an expert and per close personal friends with, you know, John Carmack, John Romero, Todd Hall, all of them were best buddies. I mean, they never write me back, but I'm just going to assume they're, they're going to get back to me any day now. <laughs> so I played the new Doom, and for the first, like, four hours, I absolutely loved it. This I was kind of going in with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, expecting to hate it because it's Bethesda, and they've just been on a whirlwind of garbage for the last eight-ish years. Just the, they, nothing they build works. Which is really a testament to their their brand, because eight years of failure will do in almost any enterprise. <laughs> right, right. Like, the, their brands are strong. And so I was going into this expecting it would be bad. I don't even hate the story. I mean, the story is super cheesy and overblown, but it doesn't waste your time. It doesn't get on my nerves. It has a few funny moments. For the I mean, first one of the four hours, anyway. Four hours in, I kind of hit this wall where the game got really freaking hard. Well, it was a lot harder than I expected all the way through. This is not like Doom 2016. Doom 2016 was all right. You know, die every very occasionally. If you're an experienced shooter fan, die very occasionally. In this one, I'm dropping dead constantly. And several fights took multiple tries. Um, you know how there's this thing we talk about in, you know, the, the ludonarrative dissonance. The, the game pretends you're an everyman, just a regular Joe that's had a string of bad luck, but, you know, in the cutscenes. And then you get to ga gameplay, and your guy is this super Terminator with a uh, body count in the triple digits, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, it's like, wh which one is it, game? And then there's a cutscene, and it pretends like you were out for a light jog, you know, and not just murdering hundreds of people. <laughs> right. Um, this is the inversion of that problem, where the game tells you you're a god. The Doomslayer, he must be some kind of god. What makes him so unstoppable? And then you get to gameplay time, and I'm like, I am not feeling very unstoppable at all. I'm feeling <laughs> extremely stoppable. I'm feeling very prone to stoppableness. Your name's Ron. <laughs> Wait, Ron? Wait, what? Uh, never mind. You'll, the, people will tell you in the comments. Fair enough. I look forward to having people explain it to me. So, like, I, I sort of feel like the weapons don't hit hard enough. Like, in the old... And the, the difficulty levels don't line up with my expectations. In the old days, like, the super easy mode was don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. And the sort of normal right. middle of the road. Baby mode or whatever. Right. And the sort of normal middle of the road was hurt me plenty. And hurt me plenty was pretty much you're, you're down, you'll die like in Doom 2016. Once in a while you'll get too aggressive and too careless and, you know, make a mistake and you'll die. I started this game on hurt me plenty. And a few hours in, I started dying a lot. I was like, did I accidentally set it to ultraviolence or nightmare? What's going on here? And it, my main gripe is that the weapons just don't hit hard enough. Like, I'll hit, you know, the, the rocket launcher used to be this awesome thing that solved all your problems, but ammo was precious. Now, ammo's pretty plentiful, and it doesn't feel like it does very much. It's just sort of like a regular gun, except if you shoot people when they're closer to you, you'll get hurt too. And that's not super helpful. <laughs> and the bullets travel real slow, so, you know, if what, some of the enemies are, are fast, you'll miss. There are a couple enemies in particular, I forget what they're called, they're guys with these big horns, they move super fast, they block all attacks, and... So what you wind up with is this situation where you can't kill these guys quickly, which I feel is the Doom experience. How quickly can you kill dudes? And you're just backpedaling and backpedaling. And that worked in the original Doom. Backpedaling and circle strafing were your bread and butter. That's how you avoid being sure. attacked. But, you know, back and then, then Doom you, 2016, they switched it up and made it like you have to 
charge in and get into melee range, right? To get, like, finishing right. moves and recharge your ammo and health. Right, and I don't know what the game expects from me now. Like, I'm trying to backpedal and, and dodge around guys, but you just, you know, it teleports guys in constantly. And I've, you know, back up into a corner and then a guy appears right behind me and wipes me out. You know, because you're yeah. super fragile. You're super fragile, and it just literally it dropped a guy on my head once. Like, I saw the flash <laughs> above me, and he just came down and murdered me. Because they do tons of damage in melee. So you're backing up, and you're just backing into more guys. So you turn around to face them, and you end up with your back to more guys. And, and the other thing that pissed me off is in Doom 2016, if you keep moving, they miss you. And in this one, that doesn't seem to be the case. I'll be like doing jump up in the air, do a double jump, do two double dash moves, and I'm getting clocked the whole time, taking little nickel and dime damage from people. And I'm like, I, I don't have any idea how this game is supposed to be played. Uh, you know, I'm just taking constant damage, and I don't seem to be doing very much damage. So like halfway through the game, I dropped it down to um, baby mode. And it still feels a little tough. It's still, I, you know, will sometimes have to try a fight tw two or three times. And I'm like, come on. On the easiest difficulty... This isn't difficulty, like armchair mode, beat it with one hand ooh. kind of thing. No. This, this feels like... This feels like maybe what normal difficulty... And it seems like they've just tuned the game for hardcore fans. That, And, you know, there isn't really a mode for... You know, I don't want to drop dead. I don't want to have to do every encounter six times because that gets so old. Plus, there's a loading screen between each attempt, and that pisses me off. No, wait, you die, and then it waits for several seconds. Then a menu pops up asking, would you like to reload your next save or exit? And I'm like, why is this screen here? Why do I have to <laughs> physically push this button? Isn't the most obvious thing to just reload? If I wanted to quit, I can do that anytime I like. So I don't know what that's all about. And then there's several seconds of loading screen and then you're back into it, but a few hallways down. So you've got to like run back and just after a while, it really grates on me. Um, so anybody else that's playing this game, what are you supposed to do to kill these monsters? What? You know, what, why why do they not die when I shoot them with my bullets into their bodies? Um, and I I know I'm going to take flack for this criticism because everybody else is gushing over this game. It's getting 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100 from all the review sites. Everybody loves it. And I'm like, it's all right, but it's a little frustrating. And maybe it's just that everybody's under stress now and I'm looking for a low stress game and this is a high stress game. So maybe I'm not in the proper mood for it right now. Seems like if it was easy enough for you to have fun for the first four hours, though, like, something's got to be off. Maybe everyone else is just playing the first three hours. Right, right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Here's, a, keeping on the topic of Doom, this is my favorite story. And this makes up for being frustrated about Doom. This is the okay. best story in ages. Okay, there's de novo copy protection. You've heard about it, right, Paul? Yeah, is that like uh, some of the data for the game is on the server, and so you never have it on your computer, and they like stream it in or something? Right. So the game is on the server, or you know, so when you when a game is encrypted with Denuvo, it's both encrypted and fragmented, and the pieces you get are tuned to your the particular fingerprint of your processor so if you know you just copy the game to a different drive even if you disable all the other copy protection it'll still crash when it gets to certain pieces of code right this is how it's been described if it's on I don't someone else's is... computer so you could like right. make your own local copy for your hardware but right. theoretically if you copy to someone else's hardware even if they have exactly the same architecture it's still not going to work right Right. And that's de novo, and people claim it slows the game down. And I've seen conclusive proof that it does, and conclusive proof that it does not. People doing side-by-side -side comparisons, and the comparisons are all over the place. Some people 
proof. They'll like do it here. I'm gonna have it enabled, disabled, you know, with a game that's been cracked. Here it is without Denuvo, and it's definitely running 10% faster. Other people will do the test, and it runs 1% faster without Denuvo. So I don't, you know, there's just no way to know. I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. But nobody trusts. I mean, 10% isn't like a huge margin, but it's something. And it really sucks if if you're just barely fast enough. Like, if your frame rate would be 62 frames a second, and then de novo, assuming it works this way, drops you down by 10%, and you're below 60 frames a second, so now you're dropping occasional frames, and it makes the game a little uneven and weird. Yeah, that's no good. Uh, or if you're just barely hitting 30, and then it drops down to, you know, every once in a while you, you skip a frame at 30 frames a second, that's really annoying, because then it's basically... Every once in a while, it just is momentarily at 15 frames a second. And you can absolutely right. feel or, that. Or if the entire concept of DRM is a, a service, quote unquote, that hurts the customer and does nothing to improve the bottom line of the companies that are implementing it, that would be terrible too. <laughs> right? Right? The, the knowledge that whether it's 1% or 10%, it's for no reason, is I think what really chafes everybody. So... Here's a story from Ars Technica. Okay, what what happens is you finish the game, you know, you're programming your video game, and then you make a, you license de novo from somebody, and then they give you the software that will do this to your game executable. So it'll make this encrypted version of your game executable, and that's what you distribute to customers. Don't you don't give them your just naked unencrypted thing because then they've got the game without de novo, right? Sure. So, and, and that's assuming you've got like, I guess they have to pack all the data into the executable as well. They they don't have right. like separate folders with data in them or whatever. Right. I just saw, I forget what the difference is, but the the de novo version of a game is like five or ten times bigger. It's it's really big. What? Yeah, it's huge. Um, but so you don't want to give them the small one, you know, the one without any locks on it. You want to give them the properly encrypted one. Well, at launch, if you went into the Doom Eternal folder there's you know doom 64-bit whatever vk for vulcan version dot exe doom eternal dot exe let's say sure but then there's a subfolder called original and if you go in there you will see doom eternal no dot exe no it's a fraction of the size and if you take that <laughs> file and you go up a directory and you put it there now you have the game without de novo <laughs> what? Yo! Now, not only, now nobody else is talking about this, but as I've always understood encryption and information theory, the worst thing you could ever do is give an attacker access to both the encrypted and unencrypted encrypted version oh, of the data. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, that's just the worst. Because this doesn't just mean that hackers now have a totally a totally wide open version of doom eternal for themselves but it means they also have this wonderful wonderful working example that will help them crack other de novo games so i have to think and that DeNuvo not only that but pissed. but now every every person who installs this game has a new key has a new encrypted version that's specifically keyed to their hardware so now you can reverse engineer how it's encrypting on specific pieces of hardware Right. And the more people that you buy this game, the more versions of it you have available to 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 hack into de novo itself. Oh no. And they patched it and it went oh the the icing on this delicious cake of shade and fruit is that this was only in Bethesda's homebrew launcher. If you got the game on Steam, you didn't get this bonus version so they only oh, no. broke it on their own platform <laughs> so, so there so if you but but now that there's the unencrypted version like people can just share that around and no take backs yeah it's out in the wild like it's it's over the horse is out of the barn it doesn't matter if you close the door now oh no so I mean, that is I, yeah that is great i that's I am fantastic. So happy. I mean that I, that almost makes me want to buy a copy of Dune Eternal just so I can put my encrypted version up on uh, Pirate Bay. <laughs> right. How about it? System specs. So and that, but this is an interesting look at Bethesda, 
there's always been this argument when their games are shitty and broken and full of bugs. And some people say it's because they, they don't care, and other people say it's because they're incompetent. I think this has to be attributed to incompetence. This is a huge company priority. They would not have paid tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars to license Denuvo if they didn't care about using it. So having it broken with their own just absolute aversion to any form of testing or review shows that there must be a massively dysfunctional development pipeline there. Wow, and yeah. It's publisher is, wide. Oh. Mwah, I love it. It is so delicious. So, Paul, what have you been playing this week? Well, other than Satisfactory, of course, uh, I've also been playing, or one evening, I played A Short Hike, uh, which is a game that was free on the Epic Game Store last week, I think. I think I picked it up, but I haven't I haven't even installed it yet because, you know, that's how I do. Yeah. The the kids were watching a movie and I was sitting there in the living room and I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna play some game. I'll just what's this? I wanna see what this is about. And it's it's adorable. It's very um it's it's got a weird presentation. The the graphics are all pixely, but there's clearly a three-dimensional world that it's rendering underneath it because you can move the camera around in 3D and the camera like pans around and stuff. So there's like this weird. Oh. Yeah, it's. I don't. I don't know if I like it, but it's certainly different. Interesting. Like, what's the subject matter? Uh it's a it's a platformer. It's a 3D. It's a 3D platformer. Uh, you're a but bird, and there's this. But it's called a yeah. short hike and not a short parkour. Yeah, well, it's not entirely all hiking. There's some amount of gliding and climbing involved. Oh, refund that. That's false advertising. I was promised hiking. Get my zero dollars back. <laughs> right. <laughs> that I had to go through the purchase process for anyway. Yeah, it was it was a fun game though. I I thought it was um it started off feeling kind of indie and like unpolished. Apparently it was like a a, a game jam game that would like won the game jam and so it got funded to completion or I don't know how that works but uh, it it did kind of feel like this kind of you know little fun little toy but not really completed but then as I went through the game there was like more and more aspects that kind of kept opening up and people were like hey here's this whole fetch quest thing or hey collect a bunch of these for me and I've already found a few and so I was like oh neat this is what these are for and uh, and then people have dialogue, and you talk to them again, and they have different dialogue, and and uh, it, I don't know, it, it has this kind of funny surface level of roughness to it, where it's like, oh, this isn't really a finished game, but then it's uh, it's got a lot of depth to it. I mean, I also just finished it in like th two or three hours, or maybe an hour, I'm not sure how long it took, but it wasn't a long game, um, but I haven't exhausted the content, and it was it was good. Cool had a sort of emotional aspect to it of you know family and uh connecting with your relatives and stuff and helping people is very um very different from from doom i'm sure they sound like the exact same game was there a lot of cyber demons on this short hike uh i haven't found them doesn't mean they're not there all right all right so there's no way to prove that they're different right yeah yeah, maybe in the fishing game, like I only caught one fish, maybe the next fish I catch will be like a some sort of evil worm thing. Fair enough. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. <laughs> Kraken. I also played an indie game this week. Ooh. Um it was it's called I don't know how to pronounce this, so I'm just going to give it give it the old guess at the pronunciation. Gorogoa. Um you can see the word written in the show notes below listeners <clears throat> i'm sure i butchered that this game is so weird it is definitely something i've never seen before i've never seen a game like this huh both okay, the title so and the game itself right so imagine you've got like four cards in front of you and okay. you're arranged in a two by two pattern right or four photographs in front of you and sure they're like a, a little you, grid a square right a little two by two grid of photographs or whatever but each individual photograph can be zoomed in and out 
like to zoom in on a particular aspect of that photograph. And you can shuffle them around in your four slots. In this game, that's what you're doing, but things you, you have to like puzzle through to get things to line up. You're sort of guiding this one character through a world. So it's like, oh, okay, this kid's standing next to a ladder, but you know, the ladder goes off the top of the, the picture. But oh, this other picture, if I zoom in on this detail, it has a picture of some train tracks from above and they perfectly match up with the ladder. So I put that picture above the, uh, the one with the ladder and then he climbs up the ladder into the other picture. And if that makes no sense, I apologize. That's the best I could do. No, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. That's, that's very interesting. And some photographs have like holes in them. Like, you know, there's a kid sit, you know, sleeping at a desk with a lamp on the desk and the lamp is off. But when you move that picture, there's a hole. The lampshade itself is a hole in the picture. And so if you put it over another picture, whatever fills that hole will be there. And, oh, here's another picture that has a bright yellow object in the shape of that lampshade. So I put one picture over the other, and now in that scene of the kid at his desk, the lamp is on, and he wakes up and does something, and that changes oh, the no. photograph. Oh, wow. That's really... I love that. That sounds really cool. It was the perfect... It's... It was the perfect a two-hour game. Just two hours of delicious good puzzles, no filter. Everything was interesting. It's got this very mournful melancholy to spoil it a tiny bit. All the photographs are of the same person at different stages in their life. So you're kind of putting their life in order. Like he starts off mm. as a little boy and then there's pictures of him as an old man and as a middle-aged man. And I don't know how much you, you can tell a little bit about his history, but it's more a mood piece than anything else. And it's about just sort of going through these little scenes of his life and wow. yeah it's so good and you wouldn't expect to have narrative content in a very mechanical game like this but it does and it makes you it it was wonderful and it wasn't just like oh here are some abstract puzzles it actually had some heart and uh some of the puzzles were like oh that's so clever so i cannot recommend this enough it was wonderful it was very cheap, and, you know, it's only a two-hour game, but I, that felt just right. I would rather just have all the good puzzles than, okay, here's another one of this puzzle that I have to do again. <laughs> so, I love it. I love it. Goro Goa. I wish it came with a pronunciation guide, but uh, I'll have a link to the trailer in the show notes if you're curious. I don't suppose they have any voice acting in the game. Not a bit. Nobody speaks. It is, there is wonderful, it looks hand animated, like hand drawn kind of pencil drawings, you know, maybe digital art, maybe some hand drawn art. It's kind of hard to tell, but I don't think it's 3D, but like the little boy walk, will walk from one picture to another once you get them arranged right. Wow. And it does not look like a 3D render. Like somebody, somebody put an immense amount of work into the art of this game. Just unfathomable amount of work. I, I it felt decadent to plow through it in two hours. Uh, or they've got a really good shader on their 3D rendering. That's also possible to make it look a little sketchy from frame to frame so that it doesn't have that perfect 3D look. That's also possible. Although then I would just hats off to whoever programmed those graphics for making it really hide the 3D-ness of those drawings. Either way, somebody deserves a pat on the back for good work. Yeah, yeah. Someone who does not deserve uh, congratulations on the extra work they're putting in is YouTube. When I saw a little notification pop up at the top of YouTube studio saying, hey, uh, you know, coronavirus is a big deal, so we're going to be doing less human checks on automated video takedowns. So your videos might get taken down and there probably won't be anything you can do about it. My reaction to this is, wait, since when do you have human beings working there? Your entire system is automated to begin with. Even, even when I reach out to contact a human, I'll get automated responses. There are so many layers of obfuscation between me and whatever theoretical human beings are running this giant contraption that 
I wasn't sure there was a man behind the curtain. And now they're telling us it's somehow possible that they could do even less. Amazing. I know, so right? amazing. Did you did you get the same notice? Maybe. Did you get it through YouTube or in an email? Uh, it was at the top of the YouTube page when, oh, when, when I, I went into studio. Oh, you know what? I haven't looked at my studio page in, in a while. Oh, maybe so it's waiting maybe. to ambush you. I was I was kind of I was kind of baffled that that they would use COVID as an excuse to do less human work. Like it seems like now when everyone's at home, especially in California where their headquarters are, like you can't go out. So everyone's gonna be working from home. So like all the people who theoretically were doing work for Google that required them to be on site now just have all this free time to like check to see if videos are violating the community standards <laughs> like what <laughs> how is this an excuse to not do human checks like nothing about right. this takes the internet out of the picture no paul you don't understand they have to physically go and remove videos the the videos are actually in cardboard boxes and so when you get takedown somebody has to go into the warehouse of videos and remove it from the cardboard box and move it into a different box and it's a room just filled with people walking around in close proximity they can't go in there that would be irresponsible <laughs> that would be you can't health health and safety standards require you to not do that so they really their hands are tied there's nothing they could have done you that's true yeah. yeah how else could google access their online internet video service but by direct interaction direct physical interaction i mean they're trapped yeah and and like even if they could access it, they probably couldn't find it. Like there's there's they'd have to develop a tool for finding things on the internet. Oh right! Like how would you even begin to do that? It's probably theoretically, and if not theoretically, at least practically impossible. Right. So we shouldn't be too hard on Google. They probably have a perfectly good excuse to be even more grossly irresponsible than they've been up till now. Ah, uh, yeah. On the other hand, it's free, so I can't complain too much, I guess. Okay, it's true. Our car has been barreling down the road at 200 miles an hour, running over your videos with wild abandon. We just want to let you know that from now on, there's no one behind the wheel. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, Previously, the person behind the wheel was, like, reading a magazine before, but now they're right. just out to lunch. Right, they actually exited the car, and it's just continuing to go without them. Thanks a lot, YouTube. <sighs> Speaking of giant irresponsible companies, GameStop. You know, everybody's closing down, and GameStop brazenly said, we're not going to close down. You know, this is some places are in lockdown, like close all non-essential businesses, because you spread this COVID-19 you know, you're not just putting yourself in danger, you're putting other people in danger. Like, it's kind of the... It's it's kind of the drunk driving thing, where it's like, we don't care if you put yourself at risk, but we don't want you putting other people at risk, right? You right. can kill other people with your irresponsibility. And GameStop is like, no, we're an essential service, we can't close. And <laughs> look, I, I value video games as an art form. I will I will stand up for video games as an essential part of your life. It's good. It, it can help you with your mental health if you have some certain kinds of needs. It can help as a coping mechanism. It can help you connect with other people. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But it is, even as the, as the foremost apologist for video games, I will be the first to admit, it, there is no way that it is an essential service. That's utter bullshit. That is ridiculous. Like, essential service is supposed to be, you know, utilities, first responders, you know, food. <laughs> and the thing food is... Food production even, and delivery, sanitation, right, uh, right. power, yeah. But even if you were audacious enough to claim that games were fundamental, a fundamental public need, you can already get games on the internet. You don't need to go to the store and buy them in boxes. Like, <laughs> it's been 20 years. 
It's ridiculous. And claiming, and then they weren't even, and they told their employees, all right, we're, we're staying open. If the police come in and ask you about it, present them with this notice. Like, this wasn't even kind of a, a like, well, you know, you know, stay open if it's okay with the police in your area. You know, we'd really like you to stay, you know, kind of doing the, the weasel thing of like, we're not insisting that you stay open. We're just saying it would be really nice if you could. And if the police give you a hard time, then, you know, just comply with them. you kind of hoping that a, a lot of stores will just stay open and the police won't waste their time hassling you, right? That would be yeah. one thing. But no, this is like, even if the police come in and confront you, you are to push back against that. And they're asking their employees, their, you know, underpaid, overworked employees to like fight the police on their behalf. But wait, <laughs> it's worse. It's worse. They didn't even like, they, they didn't have like, okay, you know, lock the door, only let one person in at a time, you know, wear these masks. Here are some gloves. Sure. They gave everybody non-contact thermometer to check for temperature or whatever. Right. Instead, they were like, um, "Here, we'll be sending you some hand sanitizer." Oh, That's good. It. And not, and uh, not all the stores got hand sanitizer, so their half-assed effort was also incomplete. So, uh, um, I, does does hand sanitizer actually kill viruses? There is some debate. I've heard. I've. I can't tell. I saw a video where Are somebody... Are viruses actually alive? Right. I, I, I saw a video <laughs> with somebody who was some kind of doctor said, look, this thing won't die with the usual methods. It's not going to help. No, this is what you need to do. It's spread by respiratory things. You know, you, you can't just cover everything in alcohol and call it a day. That won't make you safe. And then another equally reputable doctor said exactly the opposite. <laughs> just wash your hands. It's not spread totally in the air. Wash your hands and sanitize surfaces and it'll be totally fine. Primary transmission route is human contact and touching your face. Don't do those and you will be totally safe. And everybody I talk to, like, has a different story and nobody knows what's going on. So, yeah, I don't it's know. It's novel coronavirus for a reason, right? It's actually spread verbally. <gasps> Over like, the internet? Somebody... Yes, if somebody describes the virus to you, then you've got it. It's that's what makes it so novel. <laughs> yeah. We've never had this so as it's a, a transmission meme virus. now. <laughs> literally a viral meme. Yikes! That's a big yikes for me, Seamus. <laughs> so, okay, so so GameStop is saying like, use these incomplete methods that we have prepared you incompletely for, in order to resist, up to and including the police in order to maintain our shitty games resale business. Right, right. And so that's not even the worst part. They require everybody to work. You need, if you don't want to work, it's not just good enough to say, look, I'm asthmatic. This would kill me. They want a note from your doctor. They want you to tax the already bursting, bursting at the seams healthcare system to get a permission note before they'll let you off work without firing you. It, well, I mean, if the other option is that just close the store and you're fired anyway, I guess it's not much of a choice, but... It is just, and then, of course, there was an outrage. You know, the people who are most outraged are like, you know, a restaurant is like, man, we barely make rent every month. We're just, our margins are so tiny. We're barely pulling through, but we closed and you guys are going to care, keep your, and we sell food, you know, and you right. guys are going to, you guys are going to keep your games resell, your game pawn shop open during this, you assholes. Oh man. Uh, but. They, they had a change of heart. The good news is they decided after enough public outrage, after enough public fury, they eventually agreed to shut down in California. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, there was the governor's order saying everyone is shut down. Right. We will show. Okay, now that you're pointing a gun at us, all right, I will do the bare minimum to not have you point your gun at me. Like... <laughs> So oh, they're still they open are everywhere so else. 
Uh, that's the last I heard. The news might have changed in the last 24 hours since I caught this story. And it, it might change again between now and Monday morning when this podcast goes live. So, wow. I'm not sure. And well, the, there's no press like bad press, I guess. Right. But, like, you can get games online. You can get so many games online. It's ridiculous you how many games... You get more games like, free online now than ever. There are probably more free games available on the internet than there are boxes of games on the shelf of your average GameStop. <laughs> <laughs> By Easily. a wide margin. Yeah, you go in... You know, if... If you're not going to count the six used copies of Madden 18 they've got on the shelf, you know, if you if you only count individual titles, then it's it's no contest. Go on Steam and click on, you know, games free or games under, you know, and go to the Epic Store and look at what they've got for free. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And, and if you're and willing God to spend Galaxy five, is giving games away. Yeah, like everybody's and, giving and, games away because they're like, hey, look, everyone's stuck at home. If we can get them to download our platform for free games, then maybe they'll buy something. It's good for everyone. And how many free to play MMOs are there? Like a lot. Oh, man. Yeah. So, yeah, there are just so many games. GameStop, GameStop wasn't useful before the outbreak. So it is much less useful now that games are even more plentiful. These guys are ridiculous. Now, we used it, to have a GameStop in our town years and years ago, and uh, and the, the 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 retail place that they were in kept changing owners. Like they moved out of there years back, and uh, then the, there was like a bank there, and then like now there's a pizza place there, and uh, and they're closed too. So in the middle of this, this GameStop has been dying for a while now. And yeah. recently they announced their initiative. They're trying to turn um, their GameStops into like internet cafes with rows and rows of computers so everybody can sit side by side and game yes. together. Yes, <laughs> like yes. Their... And all breathe the same air. Right, right. And you can use that keyboard that somebody else just sneezed on five minutes before you came in. Uh, it's a great idea. I mean, they, they have the internet cafes like this almost everywhere except the U.S. I don't know why they're not more popular here. Maybe because people can buy their own computers. But, right. uh, you know, it's it's a great thing, but uh, timing could not have been worse. Right. I, I The only thing that could make this worse is if they announce, hey, we're going to make sure to keep it nice and warm and damp in here, and everybody has to change seats every 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> mouse hot potato wireless mice right. and you have to toss it to your neighbor <laughs> right <laughs> um shuffle so oh man that would actually be a neat party game aside to have like if you could somehow shuffle the keys that that connect the dongles to the mice so then like suddenly your mouse is running someone else's computer and you got to figure out whose it is and then trade with them like an yeah, online yeah, exactly. team shooter where every few minutes everybody's mice get randomized so you've got to go with the rest of your team and everybody throw each other their mice yeah, that would be, I don't know, it seems, that sounds kind of fun. All right, well, now, I, I want to defend GameStop a little bit before heaping even more shame on them. Okay. Is there a third, is there a third twist to this story? No, no, it's just another angle to look at it. I understand that GameStop isn't doing well. It's entirely per possible at this point that they are making it, you know, month to month or maybe even week to week. Like, maybe their margins, or maybe they're even losing money, and the creditors are just, you know, at their heels. And shutting down for a couple months would just completely tank the company. And yeah, so it's going to tank a lot of people. I mean, like, yeah, it's a serious, it's a serious thing to shut your entire business down for two months with no income. And like, that's, that's not, no one wants that. No right. I understand. I mean... I mean, you still got to pay rent. You've still got, you know, to keep the utilities on. The, you, there's taxes that are still need to be paid. There are all kinds of things going on. You have ongoing expenses, but no more income. And that's going to really choke a lot of people. And I understand GameStop has been on hard times, and this will probably kill them. This might, you know, maybe if we saw the financials, we'd see, okay, this is do or die from them. They literally can't afford to shut down. But my counter argument is... 
If you can't make money selling video games, this is, video games are more popular now than they've ever been before. If you're dying at the zenith of video games, then you are doomed. <laughs> you're you're going to die this year or next year. So don't put human lives in danger to squeeze a few more months out of this sinking ship. Go out gracefully. Make it look like, oh, we could have made it, but we had to shut down because, you know, of the coronavirus. It's not our fault. We're still good exe executives. Please hire us somewhere else. Like, this is your golden opportunity yeah. to yeah. shift blame. <laughs> be a weasel. Don't be a villain. Right? Yeah, th this is just villainy. It's just so, like, comically irresponsible. Just what were you thinking? How did you think people were going to respond to this? Wow. All right. Well, we have one mailbag this week. I and guess it's on topic even. Right. It's it is on topic. I we only got one question this week. I guess the other questions didn't make it through. Email delivery is probably down. All the email delivery people are off work. The big email yeah. clearing houses, you know, the big email warehouses are just packed with undelivered emails and there's nobody around to deliver them. And they're all they're being quarantined so they can, we can make sure that they're not transmitting anything nasty. Right. Well, here's our one email. Dear Diecast, you probably know by now that I'm a big fan of Dungeons and Dragons Online. All right, everybody. I want you all to think in your minds, who wrote this email? You know the answer. <laughs> and I'm not making fun of you. We love you, Jennifer Snow. But yes, everybody knows you love Dungeons & Dragons. Online. I'm sorry. Dungeons & Dragons Online. Like, I'll be like, I'll be talking about, you know, oh, the, the Commodore 64 was a really interesting architecture, and I wonder why that faded away soon, and she'll post a comment. Have you tried Dungeons & Dragons Online? You know? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't actually do that, but she mentions it a lot. She mentions it as often as I mention Mass Effect. Although I think her her relationship with DDO is way more healthy than my relationship with Mass Effect. Anyway, you probably know by now that I'm a big fan of Dungeons & Dragons Online. And Standing Stone Games did something really cool, I think. They made all the, the adventure content in both of their MMOs... Uh, Dungeons and Dragons Online and Lord of the Rings Online f available free until April 30th. And then she has a link and this entire email will be in the show notes below. I thought it was this was really cool and I wonder I'm wondering if you or the other diecast folks might stop by at some point. It doesn't seem to be a marketing ploy, just something they wanted to do so people going through tough times could have access to a fun game. Jennifer Snow. Thank you for that email. I don't, I haven't considered playing Dungeons and Dragons online, but I often think of going back to Lord of the Rings online. I, I don't even think the gameplay is that good. It's very much like a WoW clone and very old, like WoW has evolved quite a bit and Lord of the Rings online did not evolve much. It still feels like that hot bar style combat where it's made for dial-up levels of latency, right? You, it, it's not very responsive. <laughs> is how I'm trying to say it. Sure, sure. It's it's got it's got a kind of a, a twitchy. It's it's like halfway between a twitchy uh, hot bar management game and an idle game. Right, and I don't like the gameplay, but I love the world, and it's just so. I mean, I know I savaged it in my let's play. I made fun of everything. But I really love Lotro, and I think it's super charming. And the world is just gorgeous, and I kind of miss it as a place. Like when I think back, oh, I'd like to see that place again and run around again. And that would be fun. Um, but I never do, because I'm so busy. So I, I'm on the site. I follow the link here. What's, what's, how do you, how do they make their money? It says that you don't have to pay monthly fees. Um, they have a bit of pay to, pay to customize, pay to, I, f I forget what it all is, because I have a, a free, cosmetics or I something. Have, 
yeah, cosmetics, it, it was very understated, the stuff they sell. And most of it, you don't get until end game. Like, most of it doesn't become... Like, you could buy stuff in the early game, but most of their sales focus on hardcore fans who have run into the end game. Which, that's huh. the most gracious way you could do that. Like, okay, you've played this game for, like, you know, six months. I mean, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable that maybe we ask you for a little money. And I really I really love the company. I, I really like the world. I haven't tried DDO. But I love Lotro. I, I still recommend it if you if you like mid aughts um, or late aughts um, MMOs, then now's the time to try. And that's it. also free to play. I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, uh, it, I forget. Like I said, I I forget how the monetization worked in Lotro. Um, because I have a lifetime complimentary i have a press account basically they 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 saw my let's play online and one of their marketing people just reached out to me and comped me a lifetime oh, that's membership. right yeah yeah, yeah. oh cool so, a, a lot of it is invisible to me i know that as a lifetime member i get some sort of stuff every month and i forget what it is it's probably some sort of meta currency that i get and a you know an allowance every month as long as you log in, which means, you know, I'm not getting oh. any right now. But you know, you get that, and it maybe saves you some grind or it gives you access to some fresh content. So I'm not sure how it works. I'm not the person to ask. But really, if you were a fan of late aughts MMOs and you liked grinding up alts. You know, alternate characters. You know, just play through the play through the mid game and start a new character. Then I cannot recommend Lotro highly enough. It's lovely. It's charming, and it has immense respect for its source material. Way more respect than anything else that's come since then. Like, get out of here with that shadow. I of would Mordor. love to. I would love to to play it. I also don't have the time to commit to an MMO right now. I. I have this foggy memory that I tried DDO at one point. I think I think I tried it based on Jennifer Snow's recommendation. And this would have been years and years ago and my memory is hazy, but I remember creating a char you I remember creating a party. If I'm not confusing it with another game, you don't create a character, you create a party. Is yeah. how I'm remembering it. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. And if I am confusing it with another MMO, then I'm dumb and I'm sorry. But I remember creating a party, and then you sort of go on different adventures with that party. Um, but I didn't get very far into it. I think I was looking for games to do Let's Plays with, and I had no idea how to approach a game where I make the entire party. Because there's huh. the, my, my shtick is always, I play the straight man, the writer of the MMO plays the clown. And I take their story as literally or figuratively as necessary to make it sound really stupid. And then I react to it, right? But how do you do that when you control all the characters? If I make my characters fight among each other, then that's just a puppet show where I've got a sock puppet on yeah. each hand and they're arguing with each yeah. other. That is a genre, but it's not your genre. Right. Mine is is reacting to perceived and occasionally slightly exaggerated um, or unintended, you know, implications for, you know, on the part of the writer. Because that's fun. Sort of, what if I actually had to inhabit these silly worlds instead of look at them from the outside? And I love doing it. But yeah, I couldn't figure out how to make that work within Dungeons & Dragons Online. Huh. Well, yeah, like I said, that that sounds really neat. I, I, man, I wish I had more time to play video games. It is sort of deeply ironic. Everybody else is, you know, playing video games these days. Um, yeah. Oh, it, it, an interesting, I didn't put this in the show notes, but this is an interesting aside that I'd never really thought about. Some people are complaining the internet is really congested right now. Hmm, I wonder why. Would, 
Yeah, well, that makes total sense. But then, of course, somebody, probably an old-timer, started complaining about video games sucking up all the bandwidth. So somebody broke down how many gigabytes per hour a game consumes. And, like, the top, the most bandwidth-sucking game out there was... It was tied between Destiny 2 and one other game. I think maybe CSGO or something. Is this like for all players or per player? Like per player. How much is your connection oh, devouring? Wow. And, and so those are the two worst. Probably because CSGO has like really high update. Probably has like, you know, 30 or 60 fra frames of updates per second. So you have a lot of right. upstream and downstream traffic coming. Those are the two highest, and both of those are lower than the bandwidth required, even for SD video. Yeah. Yeah. So people streaming, like, 1080p video are, like, an order of magnitude more than any game. It's not even... Yeah, you could have, even, you could have one guy streaming video, and, and that'd be the same bandwidth as, like, 10 or 20 guys playing video games. Right, and mo a lot of games are way, way lower. Like, some of the games are... Even even shooters and, and things uh, don't seem to use as much as you'd expect when you put them on the same graph. It's it's actually kind of like, wow, games are pretty efficient. And yeah. if you're playing well, a... Well, because the, uh, the, the latency is what you're trying to minimize, and you minimize latency by minimizing data flow. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to overwhelm your connection with just too much data and choke it off. So you need those packets to be nice and small. And, you know, you're not streaming the whole screen of data. It's just positional data, and then it's rendered on the client side. So, yeah, way more. Yeah. Can you imagine, Seamus, can you imagine someone trying to set up a service where you're actually streaming the whole like rendering remote and streaming the whole data stream from your to your screen and like not doing anything client side can you imagine the foolishness of that endeavor that would never happen paul that's ridiculous like can you imagine trying to sell that to people that would like how would you even make to do that it makes no sense yeah yeah I, i'm glad google's got their act together They've got youtube <laughs> they've got them out of that warehouse with all the cardboard boxes and they have not tried to stream full screen video instead of rendering client side. Ah, oh, Google. They really have their act together. <laughs> uh. Well, I feel we've done a show. Also, I want to apologize to everybody who comes here and doesn't want to hear about stupid coronavirus. Like, my goal when setting up today's show was. No coronavirus bullshit. I want you to come to my site and think happy thoughts and escape from the horrors of the world. But these topics just sort of crept in and it's like, well, they these are applicable and these are the hot topics of the day. So I am sorry for intruding on your happy fun times with more real world existential angst. Thanks to Jennifer for sending in a question. If you'd like to send in a question to the show, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul.
So can we get Bethesda to handle uh, Google Stadia and maybe they'll just like send everyone a copy of every game? <laughs> maybe they'll cancel each other out. Their mutual off awfulness will cancel each other out and they'll make something awesome. Because that's how it works, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, let's go with that.